continue our conversation about integrated marketing communications. So we said it's not just about advertising. Advertising, of course, is in, important. What are some of the key takeaways from last time? Just briefly to recap, we talked about different advertising mediums. So once we decide what our target audience is, who is the people we're trying to reach with our advertising, that's what target audience is, is the people we want to reach with our advertising. And remember we said that usually the target audience is a subset of the target market. Who could explain why that is? Because sure, your target audience is who you want to reach with your advertising, but you also want them to buy your product. Isn't that the distinction we made? We said the target market is who you want to buy your product, and the target audience is who you want to reach with your advertising. But I said, but they're not always the same. In fact, I said very often, the target audience is a subset of the target market. Why is that? Remember we talked about the $100 bottle of perfume? So why is the target audience for a given campaign going to be different than the target market? firm that um, you want to build brand awareness, because if it wasn't for branding, it wouldn't be advertising. Would there, what do you think? I mean, what would you say in the ad? Unless you're just going to advertise to create category need for orange juice, then what is the ads going to talk about if it's not going to talk about the unique selling proposition of a particular brand? We're not going to talk about the brand promise. We're not going to talk about the points of difference and the points of parity for our particular brand in a category. All the products in a given category provide the same functionality or the same benefit. Cars, we said, all provide transportation, but some cars are $20,000, and some cars are $220,000. Why? Well, the product is wrapped in a brand, and the brand is what communicates that point of difference. It's what differentiates one product from the other. So our objective, absolutely, is to create awareness. We want to achieve a high level of brand recognition, and brand recall. So when we say awareness, you say, well, what is awareness? Well, awareness is, when we're trying to create brand awareness, we're trying to create recognition, which means at the point of purchase, people will recognize our logo, our symbol, our packaging. And that's why in every ad, you always see the logo for the company. Not all companies have symbols, but you always see the logo for the company. That's a must. You can't leave off the logo for the company. So for example, at Brooklyn College, if we're going to promote an event, the promotional materials should have the Brooklyn College logo on there. That's important. People need to know that it's a Brooklyn College event and also be able to recognize the Brooklyn College logo when they see it. So the target audience is who we want to reach with our advertising. And to be more specific, let me say this. 
it's not something mysterious. Our target audience could be women between the age of 18 and 39 who have at least high school education that are of any race, or it might be that we want to specify a particular race. We say that um, our target audience is women 18 to 39 that are African American or Asian. And the reason why it's important to specify, because our target market is all women. We want to sell our $100 bottle of perfume to all women from 18 to 88. Be ambitious, you know, you got to think of these things. Don't rule anybody out. 18 to 88. And all religions, all nationalities, all income levels. See, so it's all those demographics. So when we say, what is the definition? How do I, so coach, when I actually write it out, what do I put down when I say, this is my target market? Well, you specify all the demographic characteristics of the people that you want to buy your product. And in some cases, it might be all religions, all races, all income levels, all levels of education, Now, that being said, we have to decide if that's our target market, everybody that we want to buy our product, who is going to be the focus of this particular advertising campaign? Now, we're going to have multiple advertising campaigns that are in place simultaneously. But the one that we're going to be developing is going to focus on not women that are 18 to 88, but women that are 18 to 29. Who have income of at least $20,000. That are Asian. So once we know who the target audience is, that's going to determine what media is best to use to reach our target audience. So two important aspects of advertising are reach and frequency. So before we can reach them, we have to know who they are. So of course, Michael, reach is important. I got it. Reach is how many people are going to be exposed to our ads. But we have to define who those people are. Once we define that it's women that are 18 to 28 who are Asian and have an income of at least $20,000, then we're in a position to decide which TV channels to advertise on. Which radio stations, which newspapers to have print ads, which magazines to have print ads, where we're going to put our billboards, what the messaging is going to be, and what talent we're going to use. What does that mean when we say what talent? So in other words, who is going to be in the commercial? So if it's if our target audience is Asian women, then is it going to make sense to have an African-American woman in the commercial? Because remember, we want our commercial to resonate with the target audience. That means that they could connect with that commercial. 
that it's going to be meaningful to them, that it's going to get their attention, we're going to create interest, desire, and action. What is the action? The action is that they're going to buy the product. So our friend <coughs> Ada, Ada is our friend and she's responsible for helping us to get the attention of the target audience. So remember, we said our ads, whether it's a print ad or a commercial, has got to have stopping power. It's got to be able to get people's attention. Why? Because there's a lot of clutter. There's a lot of noise. What's clutter? Go ahead, Annie. Like the other businesses that are not, like the other things going on around the world. Right, absolutely. The other commercials, for example. The other billboards. So, take Times Square, for example. Or... Hong Kong, or Las Vegas, or Miami. Those cities have been transformed by billboards. Because there's billboards everywhere. That's clutter. So if next to your billboard is another billboard, and then another billboard, and another billboard, that's clutter. And very often what happens is we experience sensory overload. We see so much, there's so much stimulus that is, we can't perceive everything. We have to find a way for our billboard, for our print ad to stand out from the clutter. So we gotta be able to have that stopping power? How do we get people to pay attention? Because what are they doing when, um, when the commercial comes on? They might call their friend, they'll send a text message, they'll put, post an update on Facebook, they'll go into the kitchen, they'll change the channel. How do we get people to stay engaged? And to watch our commercial, and ideally to be able to process the messaging. Because there's certain information that we want to communicate. We want to communicate our value proposition, our unique selling um, point. What makes us unique relative to other brands in the marketplace? So we encode that, we create this commercial or a print ad. Well, what happens if we've encoded it, then the viewer has got to decode that messaging. It means they have to process the messaging and learn the messaging. Questions about that? And we talked about the different media types, right? So let's talk now about scheduling. Because last time we started to talk about day parts, like what time of day we're going to advertise, for example. And we need to decide which magazines we're going to advertise in because it's usually not going to be just one. So we're going to look at the profile of the readership. Magazines have a profile of their readers. What's the profile? The profile tells us what percentage of the people are 18 to 29, what percentage of the people that read their magazine are 30 to 39, what percentage of them make more than $20,000, 
all the demographic things that we were talking about. So what we try to do is align the profile of our target audience, those that we want to reach with our advertising, with the profile of the media. Every magazine has its own demographic profile. Some magazines are heavily read by women. Very few men might um, read a, a particular magazine. So for example, how many men here read Cosmo? See what I mean? But you should read it. You should. That's one of Coach's tips. It'll change your life forever. Um, what would you think, for example, a magazine like Ebony? What percentage of, um, of the readers are female black women? Right? Without even going to their website, because you can go to their website and get this information, but they're targeting African American females. So we look at our target audience and the profile of our target audience and try to match that up with different magazines. It's quite a challenging um, responsibility to do that. You're not going to find one magazine that's going to reach everybody in our target audience. So very often what we do, um, in my experience, you advertise in at least 10 magazines. 10 different magazines, because in a given magazine, you might only be able to reach 30% of your target audience. What does that mean? That means that 30% of the people that read that magazine are 18 to 29 and make at least $20,000 and are Asian but the other 70% are, let's say, older than 29, and they're not Asian. You see, you see the problem? That's our challenge. So then we try to find magazines that, for example, as part of our integrated marketing communications plan, we try to find magazines that are heavily read by female Asians. So we don't want to reach everybody. We're targeting a specific group of people with our advertising. And ideally, we're going to customize our advertising. So if we do that, then if we're targeting um, Asian women that are 18 to 29, then I shouldn't be in the commercial. An African-American woman shouldn't be in the commercial. You need to have somebody that is Asian in that age group. So not just Asian and 75 years old, but Asian and like 18 to 25. Do you agree? Does that make sense? So what about you guys? You all um, young college men. So if my company was selling, let's say, cologne. So we talked about $100 bottles of perfume. Let's say now we're talking about a $100 bottle of cologne for men. So if I'm in the commercial and I show you the, the bottle of cologne and you see me there and you're like, I'm not, I'm not really feeling this. Do you agree? Is that, um, is that reasonable? But if Dimitri, you see Dimitri in the commercial, or you see Josh, or you see Edward, then you're like, oh, cool, yeah. Somebody that you could relate with. Now, we have to decide on a schedule. We have to decide how often we're going to advertise. So we're talking about integrated marketing communications. Part of our plan is to advertise. Well, we have to decide whether or not 
our schedule is going to be what we call continuous. So are we advertising all the time? Edward, help me. Uh, let's O-U-S. See. O-U-S. O-U-S? <laughs> Continuous. That's pretty close. What do you think, guys? What's going on here? What's wrong with this marker? It's not, it's not writing properly. Let's see. Continuous. Yeah, I think this is right. That's it. All right. So let's say these are months. Continuous. Month one. Month two. Month three, month four, month five, six. So this is January, February, March, April, May, June, etc. So this is an example of our schedule. What is our schedule? In this case, we're saying that we're going to be advertising every month. But what is, are there any other choices? What about if we decide we're going to advertise every other month? How about seasonal? Yes, we could, we could um, advertise on a seasonal basis. If we're advertising every other month, what do we call this type of scheduling? Flighting. Flighting, yes. This is an example of flighting. So we could advertise every month, or we might, let's say, advertise every other month. So flighting means that there are periods during which we advertise, and then there are periods in which we don't advertise. It could be because of seasonality. Do you think this makes sense? Um, do you think flighting makes sense for every business? Or what do you see as being the maybe a, a weakness of this approach? I mean, if it's a standard SKU item on, book, uh, on shelves, it might not make sense to do a flighting. But if it's something like costumes or, or Christmas related, then flighting or seasonal might make more sense. But general day-to-day -day items might not want to just do flighting. And what would be the, the risk of doing that? Losing audience. You're losing audience and? Sales. Sales, and we're, um, we're investing money to create awareness. And it's losing the awareness. Everywhere. And then as we're creating some forward momentum, what happens? We stop advertising. And then and it, we have clutter. So out of sight, out of mind. So we stopped advertising, we think, for whatever reason, we stopped advertising for a month. And so while Coke is not advertising, who do you think is advertising? <laughs> right, so you're not seeing for a whole month, just for example, right, just this is a hypothetical example, Coke doesn't advertise for a month, and all you see is ads for Pepsi. See, that's a, that's a problem, that's a concern. But like Edward was saying, there may be some situations where that might make sense. And there's some periods when we increase the amount that we're spending on promotions, right? Basically, everything we're talking about here is on the promotional elements, whether it's advertising, or public relations, or direct mail, or sales promotions. All of those are promotional elements, one of the four Ps. Remember I told you I said um, one of the four Ps is promotion, which includes advertising, but advertising doesn't start with a P, right? But advertising is certainly an important promotional element. So our schedule, right, our schedule, we have to determine if we're not advertising during that month, are we, do we have any sales promotions? Like what would be some examples of sales promotions? Coupons and... Yeah, coupon, 
A coupon, what do you think? Is, is a coupon effective? So you have a coupon that you can redeem at the retailer that's for a dollar off. Do people use coupons? Yeah, people use coupons. Their redemption rate is relatively low, but certainly um, consumers use coupons. And the effect of the coupon is what? What does a coupon do? It saves you money, which means gets you in the store. It, it might get you in the store. Certainly, um, more sales. More sales by lowering the price. So the impact of the coupon is it lowers the price, and if it lowers the price, then absolutely it's going to increase sales. It's going to get you in the store. All of those things are going to happen. And what about deals? Deals are, for example, buy one, get one free. A BOGO is a, is a deal. Premiums. So an example of a premium would be that if you buy the um, shampoo, that it comes with a small bottle of conditioner. Or maybe it's not even a small bottle. Maybe if you buy the shampoo, you get a same size bottle of conditioner. Rebates, Rebates absolutely. What are we, um, what is, in addition to what we mentioned already, what is um, something that we hope is going to happen as a result of these sales promotions. More sales than cost cut. Yeah, absolutely. So we're definitely hoping that the total revenue is um, going to compensate for the price reduction. So overall, we're going to have total dollar sales that has increased. The number of units has increased, and our total um, margin has also increased. So that if we lower the price 10%, that sales increase by maybe 30%. And what else? Think about um, what we know about, remember we talked about behavioral segmentation and usage rate. We talked about heavy users, moderate users, and low users. Do you think any of these promotions will have an impact on those that are low users? Or non-users even? That's our expectation, is that we're trying to get trial. So if one of the reasons might be for people not buying our product is the price. So there's a risk, there's a financial risk. Sometimes there's a social risk. What's a social risk from purchasing a product? Um, it's if people just generally don't dislike the product. Like yeah, that people might think um, that you're not cool. So that might be a concern. So you want to buy a product that's going to that's gonna make you um, cool, that's going to uh, make you acceptable, that um, you have a product that your friends approve. So there's a risk for certain products that um, if you buy that product, it can impact, let's say, your popularity. But sometimes we're worried about the price. And so if you get a coupon that's a dollar off, or $20 off, or a $100 rebate, then that reduces the financial risk associated with making that purchase. And we're anticipating that that's going to result in trial that people will buy the product, they'll try it, even though they, maybe they never used it before, and then they'll be repeat purchase. So one of our objectives of um, a promotion is to get people to try the product, who have never used it before, and ultimately to get them to buy the product again. In some cases, we'll even go so far as give free samples. So forget about the coupons, right? Well, I'm going to give it to you. 
That's how much we um, have confidence in our product. We're going to give you a bottle of Tide. We're going to give you a package of Oreos. Because we have so, we're so convinced that once you taste this cookie, that you're going to love it. And when you open it up, and the cookies are done, there's a coupon there for a dollar. So free samples um, for some companies is a major part of their promotional strategy. In fact, more and more um, sampling is being done in store. So they want you to try the product at the point of purchase. In fact, there's point of purchase displays. So in addition to the shelving, there's corrugated displays of product. <coughs> We're trying to get trial, but also stimulate impulse purchase. So we're trying to get people's attention by having these displays in the store. <clears throat> What's the difference between a contest and a sweepstake? Because those are types of uh, sales promotions, but you might think that they're the same, but they're, they're really not. Sweepstakes, contests, those are types of sales promotions. What's the difference? You could win something. Both of them will allow you to potentially win something. But <coughs> a contest is based on skill. So you have to do something other than enter into the drawing. You have to design a logo, for example, or develop a print ad or write a jingle for the commercial. So you have to do something that demonstrates some skill. A sweepstake, all you need to do is enter your name basically into a raffle. And you might win a trip to Hawaii. <coughs> no, we don't like Hawaii, but where do you want to go? Costa Rica. Oh, that's <laughs> So both of those are um, tools, sales promotion tools that we could use to ultimately increase sales, but also build awareness, build brand awareness. So do you agree if we have a, a contest, does that create a lot of buzz, some word of mouth, people talking about the contest, the competition, about developing a new logo or deciding um, the packaging for a particular company or what the new website is going to look like or the color for their brand. So in other words, the trade dress. You guys remember it wasn't that long ago that UPS had a campaign around its trade dress, which is what? What is the trade dress of UPS? Brown. Brown. So there was a lot of discussion around, well, what should be the color of UPS? Um, that's when you had a good um, contest this year. They had the, the shoe contest on Instagram. It was like viral all over the world. They were putting shoes on Instagram. And and the, they would pick a winner each day, and whoever won got $500 gift cards. Nice. So what, you would upload your photo of your coolest shoes? Is that what it was? Yeah. Shoes, right? Like your favorite pair of shoes. Oh, okay. And you have to like, hashtag it, and whoever won got a $500 gift card. Each Good. Day, they would pick a winner. Good. That's excellent. So we're trying to engage. We're trying to engage our customers. So would you agree that to have like that contest is achieving a high level of engagement with your customers or your potential customers? I think um, it's a good idea and also it looks at, I think it's a good idea because they're seeing what the buyers want. So if they want something that looks like the shoes, maybe we should get it. Like that's also a good idea to get into 
Right, absolutely. So, to the extent that there's a level of direct response, that's very helpful because that allows us to measure the effectiveness of our marketing communications. So, for example, if in our print ad, which you said some of the, we have some key components in our print ad. We have a headline. We have the image. We have the body copy, and then we have the logo, the logo and also the symbol, and very often the packaging. What is, why do companies show, um, I think we're all in violent agreement that you need to include the logo in the print ad because we're trying to create brand awareness. Why show the packaging? Why is it important to show the packaging? So that people know what they're getting. So people know what they're getting. So tell us more about that, Brandon. What, what is it? Why is it important that they see it um, in the print ad? So they're in the magazine, they look at it and they see this, uh, this picture and they have got shoes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's like interesting and it, we have some headline that's gonna try and get people's attention. And we could also have a sub-headline. Remember, the purpose of the headline is to get attention. It's awareness. And when does that become significant? When does brand awareness become significant? Yeah, so in other words, the packaging is... Because sometimes the packaging can be appealing to the eye, so that can get more sales, that can boost up revenue or sales. Yeah, so in the store, what we want to happen is people are going to recognize the packaging when they see it. So the first time they see it is not in the store, they already saw it in the TV commercial or in the print ad. So when they go into the store, they're going to recognize it. You see why that's important when you're shopping? So that you'll recognize it at the point of purchase. And for some companies, um, they have trade dress that's strongly associated with their brand. Whether it's Kodak Yellow or Red for Coke. Whatever brand um, it is. Some companies definitely have a strong association with a particular color. They have a very strong um, trade dress. But we want people to be able to recognize it at the point of purchase. Questions? About carpet? Yes, the carpet in the casino, they encourage you to pay more money to play with the machines or something. And then oh, that has one of the packages or the Oh, the, car, the way the carpet is yeah. designed? Yeah, it's all designed in the oh, okay. like designing. So. Oh, that's interesting. I like to keep that in mind. <laughs> I just don't relate it to Don't look at the carpet, folks. That's it. That's the key takeaway, right? Like the old lights. That's interesting. How do we know how many people saw this print ad? So we're going to talk in a moment about the level of circulation for a given magazine, but how are we going to be able to measure it? Go ahead, Brandon. Well, it depends on where you put the ad in the first place, whether it could be in a certain magazine or it could be on the book. For instance, if it's on the highway, most likely you're going to get a thousand or more people looking at it as you drive by, so it's going to save their money. So, and one of the things that has um, enhanced the popularity of outdoor advertising 
is a device that Nielsen Media developed called the NPOD. The NPOD is a way for them to track how many times, for example, a person will pass by a given billboard or a bus shelter or a bench where there's advertising, which previously um, it, was, it was very difficult to, to measure. We can only estimate how many people see a particular uh, poster or billboard, whether it's in an airport or subway or a bus. But that device is a way that we could get a sample for a given individual and measure how many times they pass a certain um, type of outdoor advertising and even a particular ad in a particular area, which was not possible before. For print ads, in terms of direct response, we could have, for example, a 1-800 number. Now, what we would do, the reason why this works is, what do we want people to do? We want them to call. So one of the things, we definitely are eager to understand the level of exposure. We want to know what is our reach. So we want to know how many people saw this print ad. Now we're going to be in 10 different print ads. This, our print ad is going to be in 10 different magazines. So that means what? We're going to need 10 different 800 numbers. You see why? Because what's going to happen is when they call in to get a free sample or, for, or to ask that we send them a coupon or to send them a catalog or a brochure, we're able to track that. We know how many calls came in. And if we have a different 1-800 number, then we know from that 800 number is the people who saw the ad in Better Homes and Gardens. And from the other 800 number are from those who saw the ad in Ebony. And from the other 800 number, those who saw the ad in Vogue. And the other 800 number, those who saw the ad in Cosmo. So that's very helpful. Maybe in some cases, you might find out, because we need to know if our advertising, if our promotional campaign is effective. So sometimes our commercial may not be a success, even though we do testing before we launch a particular campaign. And so one of the metrics is we do brand awareness research on an ongoing basis. <clears throat> because certainly for our integrated marketing communications program, we're going to want to increase the level of awareness. And so that we're going to look over time, has the level of awareness been increasing? <clears throat> now you can't expect a month later you're going to see a big spike, but we're looking at over time. So the first time you do the research, it's not so important whether your brand awareness is at 20% or 50%. Certainly if your level of brand awareness is at 20%, then you have a bit more of a challenge ahead of you. But what we're looking at is change. If we're looking at the effectiveness of our campaign, so we have all these promotional elements in play, we're going to look and see, well, a year later, is it still 20% or is it now 28% or 34% or 41%? And continue to measure that over time and look for changes. That's an indication of our success. But there's got to be reach. So we need to be, there needs to be exposure. So that's why this type of direct response where we encourage people to call or to visit our website because those things, those actions, remember? Awareness, we said attention, interest, desire, and action. That action is memorable. Well, actually, Measurable. It will be memorable, but importantly, it's something that we could measure. It's measurable. So 
we need to know people are spending five hundred million dollars a year on advertising. Some companies, some are spending a hundred million, fifty million. It's a big investment. That's what we tell the finance department, isn't it? You think the um, the finance department and organization and the accountants, you think they want to spend two hundred million dollars on advertising? They think it's an expense. But we keep saying, no, it's not an expense, it's an investment. And over time, we're going to see a return on our, on our investment. We're going to reposition ourselves in the marketplace as an innovative, contemporary, user-friendly brand. And we're going to, as a result, sell more products. And if we sell more products, I like to think we're more profitable as a result. We need to be able to compare the different magazines, for example. So let's say we have two magazines, Better Homes and Garden and Ladies Home Journal. Let's say that for Better Homes and Garden, the cost of a full page color ad inserted one time is $400,000. That's actually a real number. Not exactly $400,000, but it's approximately $400,000. That means to run a full page ad like this, right? A full page ad in Better Homes and Gardens, one time is about $400,000. Now, in Ladies Home Journal, it's about $200,000, approximately. What's which one should we advertise in? Which is the better deal? So one magazine is going to charge us $400,000 and another magazine is going to charge us $200,000. So come on, aren't you guys like business students? What do you think? $200,000? $400,000. Which is the better deal? What are, what are the impression and what are the reach? You're just giving us what the price. <laughs> right, so, go ahead. Doesn't it also depend on the demographic as well? It depends on, right, we want to look at um, how much coverage is going to be, the level of waste. So you're right, we might, um, there may not be a good match between the profile of our target audience and the profile of that magazine, right, the readership. Brandon? Right, so we know we need to know the readerships, the demographic of the readership, and importantly, in terms of reach, we need to know, in magazines, we need to know the level of circulation. So that's why I didn't tell you. So it's not enough to know, okay, this is cheaper. Okay, it is cheaper, but how many people are we gonna be able to reach if we advertise in this magazine? In the world of magazines, we refer to that as circulation. So we need to know, we need to look at the cost per thousand. CPM is cost per thousand. And students always ask me this, they said, M, I don't, I don't get it, what, why is it not CPT? <laughs> like, why are you trying to confuse us? M. In, it's a Roman numeral. Roman numeral for a thousand. The Roman numeral for hundred is C. So that's where they came up with CPM, cost per thousand. So we need to look at the cost per thousand. So that we can make a comparison. Because we can't make a comparison here. We know that this is twice as, ex as expensive. But like Edward is saying, that's not enough information. So what we do is we take the cost and
and we divide it by the level of circulation and then multiply it by a thousand. Why do we multiply it by a thousand? Why don't we divide it by 10 and then multiply it by 17.6? Easier number to deal with. What do you think? So I'm, what I'm saying, I'm, that was my idea of sarcasm. Okay, but I'm saying, like, there's a reason why we multiply it by a thousand. Why? Yeah, so if we take the cost and divide by the circulation, that gives us the cost of one. The cost to reach one person. But we're looking at the cost to reach a thousand people. And an industry norm is that we look at the cost to reach a thousand people. It doesn't mean that you can't look at the cost to reach one person, but in terms of the way we buy um, and sell media, we're looking at very often um, groups of thousand. All right, so let's see if we can do this calculation. Now, as a rule of thumb, so when you do these calculations, when you calculate the cost per thousand, in the United States, you're looking at a cost per thousand between approximately $20 to, let's say, about $120. So why do I share that with you? Well, I give you that insight, I can tell you from looking at cost per thousand um, calculations is because if you do this calculation and you get like 12,622, something is wrong. Or you get something like 1,397, something is wrong. Right? That's generally the kind of range that we're looking at. Now it depends on the medium. It depends on whether it's a commercial on NBC, or it's during the Super Bowl, or it's in a magazine, or it's in a newspaper, but that's a, a range in the United States that's helpful to us to get our, our minds around that. So let's see, who could do the calculation? What's the cost per thousand for better homes and gardens? So the cost per thousand, the cost to reach a thousand people, if we advertise in better homes and gardens, is fifty dollars. So they have a circulation of eight million. The cost to reach a thousand is fifty dollars. Now the reason why we're doing this is because we want to be able to compare these two options. And we're going to do this for all the magazines. We could do this for 20 magazines. But we're trying to have an apples to apples comparison because we can't compare this and this because the circulations are different. And so what is the cost per thousand here? So now what did we find out? What does this tell us? What did we learn by doing this calculation? So the cost per thousand is the same. So Better Homes and Garden is double the price, but we reach twice as many people. But, Ladies Home Journal, and this is the way advertising is priced, so to buy advertising, it's based on the level of reach and frequency. So this is one time, so that's the frequency here is one that we're talking about, and the reach is based on that circulation. So. They understand that they reach half as many people as better homes and gardens. So that means they have to charge less. The cost per thousand is going to, well, the cost per thousand in this case is the same, but the cost of an ad, of a single ad, is going to be less. In this case, it's approximately half as much. So with the way that um, these ads are priced, we find that the cost per thousand is the same. But that's not always the case. So what if we said the circulation instead of 4 million was 2 million? Then 
what would be the cost per thousand? What's the cost per thousand if the circulation is two million? What is it? So now what do we do? So if the cost per thousand is the same, then we're going to look at, um, like Michael and some others were saying, Brandon, we need to look at the profile, the demographic profile of the readership and see if that matches or is never going to really be a perfect match, but is going to provide the least amount of waste and the most amount of coverage. What about here? What does this tell us? If the cost per thousand for Ladies Home Journal is a hundred dollars, yeah, it doesn't sound like such a good deal. Now remember when I told you before it was two hundred thousand dollars versus four hundred thousand. You said, but well, Edward said, well, we don't really have enough information to decide which is better. It's true, it's less expensive, right? So here. The cost of the ad is half of the cost of the ad here. But in terms of cost per thousand, it's much more expensive. So you see the cheaper, even though this is cheaper in this example, in this modified example, even though the ad itself is half the price, you say, coach, I got it. Look, that's half the price. This is a deal. But the cost per thousand is double because the circulation is much lower. So here we reduce the circulation for example purposes to only two million. Questions about that? No, you guys know how to calculate cost per thousand? Silence means agreement? All right, we got a couple of more minutes. Let's see. might be some of our objectives for our marketing communications plan. So remember we said our promotional elements include advertising, publicity. Last time we said publicity is an unpaid form of advertising. The problem is we have no control over what the um, reporter or news editor is actually going to say. Some people say there's no such thing as bad publicity because they think that, well, it just creates hype, it creates word of mouth. <clears throat> it depends on the category. I mean, certainly if they say your product isn't any good, I don't know how you should sort of spin that into a, a positive um, message. But with all these different promotional elements, whether it's advertising or publicity or sales promotions or direct marketing or public relations, in addition to creating brand awareness, which includes recognition and recall, who remembers the difference? What's the difference between brand recognition and brand recall? Recall is unaided. Yes, recall is unaided, absolutely. So Josh says that brand recall is unaided. Brand recognition is a type of aided awareness. And well, who could e explain? Brand recognition is, go ahead, Brandon. Brand recognition would be where the uh, commercial would play once in blue on the television or something, and then you can sort of, in that sense, you remember the brand because you see that, okay, this is Pepsi, this is the Pepsi commercial. But when it comes to brand recall, this is more for restaurants. You have to kind of go back searching in your film and try to remember, okay, uh, I, think, I think it's Pepsi that I like, so. Yeah, so um, can I paraphrase what you said? Okay, so what Brandon is saying is that um, we're going to um, recognize that logo or symbol when we see it. So based on the advertising or and our other promotional elements, we're going to be able to recognize the logo, the symbol, the packaging when we see it. Usually, uh, we're most concerned about seeing it at the point of purchase, which means in the store. 
And then Brandon said that we call this, we got to search our mind, our dome, our memory for the name of the brand. Like, for example, in a restaurant, they're not holding up flashcards and saying, do you want this? How about this? Or this? Or this? You have to retrieve from your memory. They say, what do you want to drink? Then we have to remember Pepsi, Sunkist, Mountain Dew, whatever is... Um, in our consideration set that we prefer. Do you remember we said that the consideration set and the evoke set are related, but the evoke set are all the brands that come to mind in a particular category. The consideration set are those that we would seriously consider purchasing, or maybe we do purchase already. Questions?